Hi, in this last video, we thought we would recap the journey that you have taken with us by asking the question, what did we learn? So the first lab you did um, introduced you to the Kyle IDE, the development process in general, which involves writing your code, editing it, then compiling it, running it, testing, debugging, and repeating the cycle. You're introduced to the TM4C microcontroller, um, and you'll encounter similar microcontrollers and similar IDEs. The concepts will be easily translatable to other systems. In the next lab, we learned how to program in C. And the first concept was this idea of functions, or functional abstraction, where we would encapsulate one idea in turn into a function and then use it. We had if-thens and loops. Uh, we did character I.O. with the printf, and again, Lab 5 was an introduction to the process of programming in C. Lab 6 introduced you to time, which is an important parameter in embedded systems. We saw uh, a visual rendering of events with respect to time using a logic analyzer, and we were able to verify that the expected behavior is precisely measured by visually checking it on a logic analyzer. Then in lab seven, we introduced the development life cycle, the product life cycle. And what we started with were specifications. And then we went to uh, design and implementation and testing. And we did that whole process using a concept called functional decomposition which was to break down a complicated problem into smaller pieces. And again, timing was a big deal, and so we uh, learned how to both measure and control time. So Lab 8 was your first exposure to uh, building circuitry off board, which is we were using mainly onboard switches and lights, but now you were, have to uh, design knowing uh, things like resistances, uh, measuring voltages, currents, and appropriately choosing your components for the target design. And then in Lab 9 uh, was our first effort of proving that our software works. Embedded systems, as you know, are deployed in situations where life-critical functionality must be guaranteed. And so we introduced this idea of functional debugging. And we use an array to capture the input, the output, but not only what they were, but when they occurred. And so this was a minimally intrusive uh, dumping into an array such that we could demonstrate and verify that our software and hardware was working as intended. We know Lab 10 gave uh, uh, problems to some of you. Uh, it was a little challenging, but what we want you to take You see my finite state machine? That was my answer right there. What, what we want ta you to take away from Lab 10 is that uh, finite state machines are a very effective tool that you want to have in your toolbox when designing complex systems because you separate the engine from the data and you focus on the data and the engine is the same engine that you repeatedly use for any system. And this was also your introduction to Cystic which allowed you to introduce time-related events into your finite state machine. Then in Lab 11, what you'll notice that we communicated between one computer and another and we did something very simple. But this is the essence of what people are now calling the Internet of Things, where all the computers are connected up. And in particular, embedded systems are out there at the forefront, at the edge of the world, uh, gathering information and affecting the world. And so we saw that UART was a simple way to send data in serial fashion from one computer to another. Uh, we saw that we could represent non-integer values uh, using something called fixed point. And we had a new programming uh, tool called a string, which was a variable length ASCII uh, set of characters. Lab 12 in introduced interrupts in earnest. Uh, embedded systems uh, derive their responsiveness in, in practice because they support interrupts. 
So what we did in lab 12 is showed you how you can use interrupts to uh, generate sound and the sound uh, needs to be at a particular frequency and we can get a precise frequency because we're using interrupts. Lab 13 got harder and harder. Okay? Now embedded systems must shape the world and so we need a way to connect the computer uh, which is an essentially a digital device into a continuous real world and one of the tools we used was the digital to analog converter and you built one yourself right of bare resistors and so it took a digital number and created an analog output whenever we consider this conversion between digital and analog we must sample or discretize both in amplitude and in time and that's what we call sampling and once we do that, we need a famous theorem, the Nyquist theorem, which tells us that if we're interested in oscillations up to a certain frequency f, then the data must be sampled at more than twice that frequency. That was the Nyquist theorem. So lab 14 addressed the other, the counterpart. If, if embedded systems have to shape the world, they also have to input the world, that is they have to read the world in its analog form by digitizing it. So we program the 12-bit ADC on the system. Uh, we also made sure that we wrote a driver for the ADC which involved a set of subroutines. We use a modular design. We made sure that we calibrated the, um, the analog uh, potentiometer so that we have an accurate rendering of its behavior. All right, Lab 15, which was optional, uh, was the most fun. Uh, we thought we'd put it all together in one handheld video game. Uh, we added more interrupts so you can have uh, multiple operations occurring in the background. You got your foreground. And that's called multi-threading. Uh, this allows your game to be lifelike because more than one thing can be happening at a time. Uh, the graphical structures, the, the images that we generated on the screen, uh, we used a C programming concept called structures. And uh, we rendered those structures to produce the graphical image. So again, the purpose of Lab 15 was to put all the concepts together, the D to A, the A to D, the interrupts, the C programming, the testing, all of that uh, into one program uh, that, that's fun to play. So I hope you enjoyed uh, doing all these labs, you learned something uh, and you're going to uh, use these concepts in uh, your life as you go along, develop as an embedded systems engineer. Uh, we'd like to summarize some of the best practices. Uh, these are by no means the only ones, but these are things that we think are good things to take away. Um, so rather than talk about all these, we'll talk about what is uh, our favorite of these. Uh, my favorite is try until you succeed. Keep trying. Uh, be courageous. The best programmers in the world didn't happen overnight. They, they had enough failures to talk about and that's how they showed that they're courageous and not afraid to make mistakes and show your work to others. That's how you, uh, you make sure that people can correct you and you can become a better engineer. This is my approach to life. Uh, in order to be truly successful, you need other people around you uh, to support and encourage. And so I know that I can only be better when I'm surrounded by people who are smarter than I am. So I go out in the world and find the most, uh, the nicest and the happiest and the most intelligent people and I ask, can I work with you? Uh, in that way, I know uh, that they will make me better. So I hope uh, this has been a journey that was worthwhile for you. It's been really worthwhile for us and we hope to see you again. Yep, see you on the internet.